Good morning. Good morning. If you've ever had a conversation with me or with either of my brothers, I suppose you may imagine that we've led pretty strange childhoods. Throughout my early years, the three of us would spend hours together every day playing elaborate games and engaging in intense rituals, all of which were borderline cultish. <laughs> I won't describe them here, but know that there was a lot of fire, blood, and chanting involved. <laughs> the first thing that these antics taught me was what it meant to be one-third of a whole. For the first four years of my life, I was next to my brothers from the moment I opened my eyes in the morning to the moment I closed them at night. And whether I was desperately chasing escaped guinea pigs through the forest or just riding my scooter around the neighborhood, I was comfortable in the knowledge that the other two members of my pack were right there with me. This is the way things always were. We were a unit. We went into things together, bolstered by a love that didn't need reason or foundation. This love cemented our relationships and gave birth to a trust far stronger than any other I've experienced. Admittedly, I should have trusted Ben a little less before giving him permission to do things like cut my hair, leaving me with a large bald spot that he fondly told me looked just like daddy's. <laughs> <laughs> but I never challenged Ben's judgment because I never for one second doubted his love for me. Just as I never doubted my love for him or for Jay, even when he peed on me that one time. <laughs> My brother's love was a long-standing constant in my life. It wasn't the kind of thing that you earn. It was pure, unconditional, and unwavering. As the years wore on, I began to grow cramped and uncomfortable in the happy little bubble where I spent my days. It was time for me to enter the real world, one that existed outside my backyard and beyond our childish games. And so I went off to school, dance classes, and soccer practices, and I came to know the world around me a little better. I was excited to face each of these new challenges and experiences, but I quickly became disheartened with my realization that the world I was entering was not, in fact, a slightly bigger version of the one I'd been inhabiting. Before, I'd known exactly where I fit in, but now I found myself lost, floating along, with, confused without my two grounding tethers. Catching and eating insects was no longer a socially acceptable pastime, and I couldn't act the way I did around my brothers without running the risk of becoming an outcast. That was another thing I noticed about this new world. The people in it could be really mean. And not the kind of mean that Jay got when I interrupted one of his Thomas the Tank Engine marathons. This was something wholly new. For the first time in my life, I saw people pick aspects of my personality and take personal issue with them. And that's when I started to realize that love worked a little differently outside the confines of my house. Everybody didn't love everybody else out here, and love wasn't the kind of thing that came for free. I began to love in the fashion of the people around me, carefully and rarely. I grew wary of the people with whom I interacted and less trusting of the words they said. Before, I might have loved someone for giving me a cool Pokemon card or for teaching me a new scooter trick, but as I grew older, I became more and more jaded until I no longer saw the point of offering kindness to the majority of the people I met. Over time, the tiny trusting girl in me gave way to a cynical, guarded individual. In Mark Twain's novel, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, it takes Huck's removal from society for him to discover what it means to love. Growing up with a drunk and unpredictable father and no mother, 13-year-old Huck has deeply ingrained trust issues. One day, Huck finds himself floating down the river in a raft with an escaped slave named Jim. Over the course of their journey down the Mississippi, the reader watches as the foundation of Huck and Jim's relationship transforms from one of mutual need to one of freely given love and trust. Huck has grown up in a harsh world riddled with constant physical and emotional beatings but with his escape from this vicious lifestyle, we see him slowly open up. In the final chapters of Twain's novel, the reader witnesses the death of Huck's metamorphosis when he is faced with a trying moral dilemma. After being raised in an extremely racist environment, Huck believes that he is not only breaking the law by harboring and helping an escaped slave, but also performing a highly immoral act. With his conscience, conscience weighing down on him, Huck decides to give Jim up again to slavery, and Huck begins to write a note to Jim's owner. Partway through, however, Huck rips the note to shreds and says the most powerful words in the entire novel. 
All right then, I'll go to hell. Fully believing that his choice will result in eternal punishment, Huck decides to protect his friend as a result of the constancy and love Jim has provided for Huck on their journey. With this decision, Huck completes his transformation from a lost, selfish child to a moral, self-reliant, and selfless individual. By returning to a simpler lifestyle where he is free from the pain and insecurities caused by others, Huck finally learns to move beyond the compassion he has expressed for almost everyone he encounters toward a deeper feeling, to love and to trust, to love and trust several of the people around him. <laughs> time with Jim, uncomplicated time, has given Huck a perspective on trust and love that he had not experienced before. Like Huck, we often become jaded and distrustful at the hands of our society. The transition from a simple, idyllic existence to the harsh reality of the world at large is often a hardening one, one where we shed our childhood innocence and trust for cloaks of judgment and cynicism. And although these new clothes are woven for our protection, they can often do more harm than good. The world teaches us to be careful with our love, to hoard it, and to only share it with those who have proven their worth. After having our feelings stomped upon a few times, we start to realize that it hurts a lot less when we hide part of our hearts away. As a result, we begin to decide who is and isn't worthy of things as simple as a smile or a kind word. And with these behaviors, we lose a portion of our common humanity. In Haruki Murakami's novel, 1Q84, Murakami writes, a person learns how to love himself through the simple acts of loving and being loved by someone else. When we pick and choose the people toward whom we are kind, we inadvertently tell the others that they are rejects, that they aren't worthy of our kindness. In the face of all this discrimination, our fellow humans begin to forget why they even matter in the first place. It's difficult to love yourself when you're surrounded by people who seem to think that you shouldn't. When we are young, Love is an easy thing to give and to receive, but as we grow up, life tends to grind us down until those once simple acts of compassion become difficult and convoluted. The world is an amazing place, yet it's too easy to get caught up in all its rules and expectations. If we're ever feeling overwhelmed, let's take a moment to simplify things. Try to remember that we don't get to decide who is and isn't worthy of our kindness. It is something to be shared freely and partially and frequently. And as for the cult of love, well, that requires that we give of our time and remain open to time's potential nourishing rewards. <laughs>